Hey film fans, imagine your life is falling apart. Things that you believe to be real, things that you remember, things that you thought were truths are crumbling around you. Your memories are suspect. You're having these strange dreams that seem real, that seem intensely real. And you find out some other people who are only kind of tangentially connected to you in your life are having the same dreams. Furthermore, your place of work finds out and they tell you to take a little extended break. What are you gonna do in a situation like that? Some people might just wanna relax, take a little break, have a drink and a smoke and try to figure out what's going on. But imagine you're so frazzled. You're so shaken up by this, the, the enormity and the strangeness of this situation that you can't even light your own cigarette. You think, I'd never be in a situation like that. That's crazy. Hey, if it can happen to old blue eyes, it can happen to you. Let's consider one of my favorite moments in Hollywood history as we watch Frank Sinatra try to light a cigarette in The Manchurian Candidate on this episode of Break the Scene. The Manchurian Candidate is a 1962 paranoid conspiracy thriller, and it was directed by John Frankenheimer from a script by George Axelrod and based on a novel by Richard Condon. And it stars Frank Sinatra, as I said, Janet Leigh, Angela Lansbury, and a host of great sort of 50s and 60s actors. And it was remade about 40 years later by Jonathan Demme with uh, Denzel Washington. Some of you might be more familiar with that version, which didn't receive great reviews when it first came out, but has grown in esteem over the last 20 years or so. Um, maybe I should do an episode on that. Maybe I should do a whole Jonathan Demme series. Anyway, we'll, I'll come back to that another time. Yes, Jonathan Demme. Um, it's a film about the Korean War or after the Korean War. And I don't actually want to say too much about the plot because it's just a, a fabulous movie to watch and to see how it unfolds. It's, it's weird, it's thrilling, it's compelling, it's imminently watchable. It's a black and white film. It's beautifully shot by Lionel Linden. And it, it, every scene is well calibrated to, to tell you the story in a way that keeps you wanting to watch it. So check it out. It, it's very strange. Um, Sinatra plays a guy named Marco and Marco is in the army and he was in the Korean War. And we find out things early in the film that I don't want to say too much about, but this is a kind of conspiracy film that centered around brainwashing. And Marco starts to wonder about his post-war reality. There's a man he was in the army with, who he was in Korea with, whose reputation, which he believes to be true, is much better than this kernel of his brain remembers. And it doesn't make sense to him. He doesn't understand why he remembers things and sees things as they are in one way, but also has this feeling that it's not right. It's not true. There's something wrong about this. So he starts to investigate. And meanwhile, as I said at the top, he's having these strange, very clear dreams, which are <laughs> fabulous. And I don't want to say much more about them. And he finds other people who are in Korea who are having the same dreams. So he starts to wonder what's going on. And it leads him on a couple of occasions to make a big public scene big enough that the army starts to pay attention to his outbursts. And about a third of the way through the film, his boss shows up and says, look, Marco, you need to take a break. This is an order. I'm forcing you to take an extended vacation. And that's when the scene in question happens. He decides to go from Washington to New York by train. 
and we get this moment and it's about six minutes long it's a little bit longer than some of the other scenes i've done here but it's worth watching the whole thing pay attention to the performances pay attention to the dialogue and pay attention to the the editing and the camera angles and how they all work together Maryland's a beautiful state. This is Delaware. I know. I was one of the original Chinese workmen who made the track on this stretch. But um, nonetheless, Maryland is a beautiful state. So is Ohio, for that matter. I guess so. Columbus is a tremendous football town. You in the railroad business? Not anymore. However, if you will permit me to point out, when you ask that question, you really should say, are you in the railroad line? Where's your home? I'm in the Army. I'm a major. I've been in the Army most of my life. We move a good deal. I was born in New Hampshire. I went to a girls' camp once on Lake Francis. Pretty far north. What's your name? Eugenie. Pardon? Ain't no kidding, I really mean it. Crazy French pronunciation and all. It's pretty. Well, thank you. I guess your friends called you Jenny. Not yet they haven't, for which I am deeply grateful. But you may call me Jenny. What do your friends call you? Rosie. Why? My full name is Eugenie Rose. Of the two names, I've always favored Rosie, as it smells of brown soap and beer. Eugenie is somehow more fragile. So when I asked you what your name was, you said it was Eugenie. Quite possible I was feeling more or less fragile at that instant. I could never figure out what that phrase meant, more or less. You Arabic? No. My name is Ben. Maybe Bennett. It was named after Arnold Bennett. The writer? No. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel. He was my father's commanding officer at the time. What's your last name? Marco. Major Marco. Are you Arabic? No. Let me put it another way. Are you married? No. You? No. What's your last name? Cheney. I'm production assistant for a man named Justin, who had two hits last season. I live on 54th Street, a few doors from the Modern Museum of Art, of which I'm a tea privileges member, no cream. I live at 53 West 54th Street, apartment 3B. 
asking him everything? Yes. El Dorado 59970. Can you remember that? Yes. Are you stationed in New York? Right, stationed the right word. I'm not exactly stationed in New York. I was stationed in Washington. But I got sick, and now I'm on leave, and I'm going to spend it in New York. El Dorado 59970. I'm going to look up an old friend of mine who's a newspaper man. We were in Korea together. Okay. You've got to at least be thinking to yourself, like, that was weird or uncanny or, or strange. Um, because much about it is quite normal. You know, this is kind of the tail end of classical era Hollywood. These are the sort of the big classical era stars. We're transitioning into what would become the new Hollywood, but we're not there yet. But this, you know, you could call this in a lot of ways a sort of proto new Hollywood film. And part of what's happening here, though, is there are these uncanny moments that just don't quite feel right. That's a great example of the way the form of the film mirrors Marco's own feelings. So let's just talk about it a little bit. So we open with this establishing shot of the train. It's really quick and you know, he's just been told to go on vacation and then we cut to the train, typical, right? And then we cut inside the train, typical, except we cut in on this tight shot of Sinatra. And one thing to note is that he's sweaty. And this film is full of sweaty men. These men who are experiencing whatever it is that happened to them in Korea. They're experiencing it in these kind of moments of panic and anxiety. And the black and white photography really catches this sort of, the intensity of their feeling in the sweat, the pouring sweat in some cases coming down their face. And here he is sitting on this train. And what's interesting about this first shot, there's a slow pull, but it's mostly just a tight shot on Sinatra. So we see that he's on the train, but he could be in like a private cabin. He's sitting there with a drink, but we don't know exactly where he is because of this tight shot. This is in a lot of ways kind of anti-intuitive to how you might have shot this scene where we, we get a wider shot of the car he's in or the cabin he's in or whatever it might be. And that's going to affect the next couple of shots. So here he is sitting and sweating and he decides to light his cigarette and we get this sort of comic thing where it falls into his glass and then we get the first cut. And it's just this short shot of Janet Lee. And now at this point, she hasn't been in the film. So this is a new character. She's a big star. Psycho had just come out, you know, the year before, I think. Everybody would know who this person is and be like, oh, Janet Lee, she hasn't been in the movie yet. We're a third of the way in. We're 40 minutes into this film. And it's a weird cut, though. If you think about the position of Marco in that first shot, and then the position of who we find out is Eugenie or, or Rosie, um, in this shot, it's, it's hard to tell where she's meant to be sitting in relation to Marco. She's looking at him almost straight on, but out of the corner of her eye, there's a window behind her with the landscape going past. It's rear projection, I think, or front projection or something like that. And um, it's hard to know exactly where she is. And we find out after a couple more cuts that she's sitting sort of perpendicular to him or this way um, with her back to the window, which means in that opening scene, the first, the first frames, he's staring straight ahead and she's sitting right there to his left and he's staring right past her, which makes that first scene in retrospect quite a bit stranger and creepy. You know, there's Janet Lee sitting right next to you and you don't even say hello or whatever it is. This tells us the intensity of the experience he's having, right? And so we get this short shot of her watching and then we get the second cut back to Marco, only this time it's from a different angle. And now we see, oh, yes, he is in the dining car and there are other people here. There was an indication of that in the first shot 
when he drops the cigarette in the, into the glass and he kind of looks around to see if anybody noticed. But now in a public space and we see him try again and Sinatra, you know, he's kind of doing his, I'm acting, but it's great. I love it. And then we cut to the two shot finally and we see the geography of this moment. It's only at this point when Marco acknowledges, oh, <laughs> there's a person sitting right next to me. And I love it. Even as he's having this kind of nervous breakdown, he still manages a little suave Sinatra. You mind if I smoke? Oh, not at all. But then he still can't light it. We cut back to that second angle on Marco, where we see um, the, you know, the populated dining car behind him. And then he flips out because he can't light the cigarette. A simple act of lighting a cigarette. And by the way, everybody, smoking's not cool. Don't smoke. <sighs> The movies make smoking look so cool. <laughs> I know they do. And, and this scene does too, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. But you know, don't smoke, man, it's gross. It's dirty, it'll make you sick. It's probably been responsible for the death of someone you know, just man, yeah, lay off. And so he storms away and he knocks everything over because he can't light the cigarette. And then we get the, one of the few camera movements in this whole sequence as it follows him past her. And, and we see Janet Lee again, who we find out is named Eugenie, and she's shocked. And then we cut to this low angle, uh, quick low angle shot of him sort of storming off down the, the, the passageway of the train until he gets to the end of the car. And he has a moment of, he, he breathes, he has a moment. You can still see the sweat on his brow and you know that photography's great and the, the, and the light shining off the, the sweat on his forehead. And in some films where it wasn't Janet Lee, this could have actually been the end of the scene. This could have just been a moment of Marco on his way to New York freaking out, but no. Then this happens. Okay, I dig back what I said. That was so cool. That is so, <laughs> so cool. That's one of my favorite scenes in a movie. Just the way she so nonchalantly does this. Like, she sees this person and he needs help and she doesn't know how to help him, but she knows that he wants to smoke. So she's gonna make that happen. And then we get the first sort of discombobulating moment of dialogue. Maryland's a beautiful state. This is Delaware. I know. The opening with the, the strange or the, dis, the uh, disorientating shot selection was a little bit kind of discombobulating. To, I won't say that word again. Um, but the dialogue in the rest of the sequence is going to be a mix of very like mundane conversation with these weird little moments of, wait, what? And she says, Maryland's a wonderful state, or Maryland's a beautiful state. And he says, this is Delaware. She's like, I know, but that's weird, right? That's a weird thing to say, and that's a weird thing to have as their first bit of dialogue. What's going on in the sequence is like a, a shadow world representation of typical glamorous Hollywood flirting. I mean, it's Frank Sinatra and Janet Lee. They're on a train. There's drinking involved. There's smoking involved. And there is, of course, witty repartee. They're going to bounce off each other, these clever things. That's what happens with Cary Grant. And that's what happens with Eva Marie Saint. And that's what happens with all kinds of Hollywood stars, beautiful people on trains with smokes and drinks flirting and sort of setting up the romance. Maryland's a beautiful state. This is Delaware. I know. What? This is Delaware. I know. I was one of the original Chinese workmen who made the track on this stretch. Wait, <laughs> what did she just say? I'm not sure if that can be sort of characterized as racist, even in a sort of 1961 context. 
but I'm not 100% sure, historians tell me if I'm wrong, that the East Coast railways were, were built by Chinese. I think that was more of a, a West Coast and, and the West. Um, I could be wrong about that. But also, what is that line? Like, I know I was one of the original Chinese rail workers who built... This is some grade A weird flirting. What we have here is two interesting things happening. One is this is quite a long take. So we're gonna have a couple minutes here where we're just looking at this two shot with Janet Lee sort of canted to his back against the wall angle, where she does this mix of trying to kind of calm him down, make him laugh. She's flirting, but she's also just trying to get him to talk and relax. But what's weird about it to me is that the beginning of it sounds very much like code talk. Right? Maryland's a beautiful, yeah, but Maryland's a beautiful state. So is Ohio. Like, what does that mean? It's a great football place. What are you talking about? Like, what, <laughs> what is the point of this conversation? And then it kind of settles down and they, she tries to get to know him to find something for him to talk about. And when she brings up her name and he's shocked that she's called Eugenie and then he says, I guess all your friends call you Jenny. And she's got this great line, not that I know of, thank God, but you may call me Jenny. And then we cut to a close up of Sinatra leaning against the wall. I guess your friends call you Jenny. Not yet they haven't, for which I am deeply grateful. But you may call me Jenny. Eyes closed, still in panic, but starting to calm down, in part, I think, because she's found a way to personalize the conversation. Then we get some kind of typical shot, reverse shot and close up of the two of them as they have this kind of nice conversation about her name and how her middle name is Rose and that's what her friends call her. And she has, the, there's this nice exchange where she says that uh, Eugenie is a little bit more vulnerable and he says, well, when I asked you what your name was, you said that to me. And she's like, I guess I was feeling vulnerable. Um, and then he asks her, You're Arabic? Are you Arabic? What? What? Why? That's a strange question, you know? And then they have this little bit of repartee about his name, and then she says, are you Arabic? This is strange, I think, and it's, again, it sounds like they're talking in code. And normally you just might think that this was sort of dialogue that was striving to be coy or cute, but we're 40 minutes plus into a film that is about nefarious deeds, spies, brainwashing, um, uh, plants, sleeper agents, and so on. So to have this person show up 40 minutes into the film on the train and start speaking in code is not out of the question. But if it's not in code, <laughs> it's st strange dialogue for sure. And then, as if to translate, are you Arabic? Are you Arabic? No. Let me put it another way. Are you married? How, how is that putting the first question another way? Oh, it's, it's not. It's just not. But she's bringing the conversation back to the flirting, back to, like, she is definitely intrigued by this guy. And... To be fair, this is one of the things that Hollywood did for a hundred years and still does is to take like some damaged man that you should probably just get up and walk away from and <laughs> make him seem like, ooh, he's mysterious. This, of course the beautiful Janet Lee is going to be intrigued by this guy who can't even light his own cigarette. So she wants to find out if, you know, he's a hot property. He's sweating on the train. <laughs> he's knocking things over. Hmm, I must pursue him. Yes, but also... It's done so well that I overlooked that stuff. But of course, this being 1962, that leads her to give him her address and phone number. Okay, it's Hollywood in 1962. But what I really love about that exchange is the way when she tells him her address and tells him her phone number, we're back to the shot reverse shot, although Janet Lee has moved her position at the end of the train is that it again sounds like some sort of code or trigger the way she says it. I live at 53 West 54th Street, apartment 3B. Can you remember that? Yes. 
El Dorado 59970. Can you remember that? Yes. It's it's a weird scene. So I think what's you're 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 meant to feel as you're watching this is is she in on whatever's going on? Is she some sort of agent who's tailing him, who's watching him, who's intercepting him? Um, is she from the US? Is she from a foreign government? Or is she just one of these women who Hollywood wants to tell us likes to fix broken men? And we will find out. You don't put Janet Lee in one scene in a film. And we will find out. And it's, it's a very great performance that she puts in in the film. But it's strange that she would volunteer that information, but it's strange also because of the way she does and because of the way he responds. The scene basically wraps up after this. He tells her that he's not from New York, he's going there to look up a friend. This is the friend I mentioned earlier who he has these sort of competing internal feelings about, the guy who's become a newspaper man. Um, I just find that one last thing in this sequence is, is fa fascinating, which is when she says her number again. And the way he closes his eyes and doesn't respond and just kind of takes it in. And then when he does respond, that's when he tells her he's, he's going to see his friend. Um, this is a wonderfully weird scene. It's got like super... Um, it's got this kind of sexy Hollywood glamour. Janet Lee lighting a cigarette, tapping Sinatra on the shoulder and giving it to him is one of my favorite 10 seconds in, in cinema. But what's around it is this kind of uncanny meat cute. It's not meat cute, it's meat strange, right? And that's accomplished in part, especially in the first half because of the camera angle and camera framing selection and the way it's edited together and then in the second half because of these very odd snippets of dialogue about Maryland about being Arabic and then finally in the way she gives him this information in the way he receives it and it's it, it's a perfect way to kind of end act one in the film and and set the whole thing off in in a different direction once he gets to New York once he obviously looks her up and then where the film goes from there so it's a really fantastic example of how film form dialogue and performance marry to create a feeling in a film where it looks like one thing's happening a kind of a meet cute but something else is happening there for sure and and this is one of the reasons I, I perennially love this scene and have loved it since the first time I saw it decades ago. That's all for now, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit like, please hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. I'd love to, to get this out there. Watch old movies. Watch black and white movies. Watch Frank Sinatra movies. Watch Janet Lee movies. My name's Aaron Hunter, and whatever you do, Keep watching movies.